Good morning, everybody. Shalom. Welcome to another Saturday. We've got uh, Sharon and Joel are away, um, on, sunning on the beach at Taupo this weekend. So um, we're going unplugged today. We've got a rack of voices over here. So, <laughs>
And the first reading is uh, Parasha uh, 38 this morning, uh, Korach, or it's the same English, Korah. And it's uh, uh, chapter 16 to chapter 18 of Numbers, uh, ending at verse 32. Now Korach, the son of Yitzah, the son of Kahat, the son of Levi, along with Taitan and Avilam, the sons of Elihav, and On, the son of Pelet, descendants of Reuven, took men and rebelled against Moshe. Siding with them were 250 men of Israel, leaders of the community, key members of the council, men of reputation. They assembled themselves against Moshe and Aaron and said to them, You take too much on yourselves. After all, the entire community is holy, every one of them, and Adonai is among them. So why do you lift yourselves up above Adonai's assembly? When Moshe heard this, <clears throat> he fell on his face. Then he said to Korach and his whole group, In the morning Adonai will show who are his and who is the holy person he will allow to approach him. Yes, he will bring whomever he chooses near to himself. Do this. So he's going to tell them now, if, if you are in my position and you want to do what God's appointed me to do, and if you feel that, that you know, this is uh, what God is telling you to do, then do the ministry. That's what he's telling them. Do the ministry. Perform what, what, what we are um, designated to perform. You perform it. <coughs> then... Uh, Yes, he will bring whomsoever he chooses. Do this. Take senses, Korach, and all your group. Put fire in them and put incense in them before Adonai tomorrow. The one whom Adonai chooses will be the one who is holy. It is you, you sons of Levi, who, have, who are taking too much on themselves. Then Moshe said to Korach, Listen here, you sons of Levi, it is for you a mere trifle that the God of Israel has separated you from the community of Israel to bring you close to himself so that you can do the work in the tabernacle of, of Adonai and stand before the community serving him, serving them. He has brought you close and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. Now you want the office of Kohen too? That's why you and your group have gathered together against Adonai. After all, what is Aaron and you complain against him? <clears throat> then Moshe sent to summon Datan and Aviram, the sons of Eliav, but they replied, we won't come up. It is, is it such a mere trifle bringing us up from a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the desert that now you arrogate to yourselves the role of dictator over us? You haven't at all brought us into the land flowing with milk and honey and you haven't put us in possession of the fields and vineyards. Do you think that you can gouge out these men's eyes and blind them? We won't come up. Moshe was very angry and said to Adonai, Don't accept their grain offering. I haven't taken one donkey from them. I've done nothing wrong to any of them. Moshe said to Korach, You and your group be there before Adonai tomorrow 
<coughs> you then and Aharon, each of you take his fire pan and put incense in it. Every one of you bring before Adonai his fire pan, 250 fire pans, you two and Aharon, each one with his fire pan. Each man took his fire pan, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the entrance to the tent of meeting with Aharon, with Moshe and Aharon. Korach assembled all the group who were against them at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Then the glory of Adonai appeared to the whole assembly. Adonai said to Moshe and Aharon, separate yourselves from this assembly. I am going to destroy them right now. <clears throat> they fell on their faces and said, O oh God, God of the spirits of all humankind, if one person sins, are you going to be angry with the entire assembly? Adonai answered Moshe, Tell the assembly to move away from the homes of Korach, Datan, and Aviram. Moses got up and went to Dathan and Abram. The elders of Israel followed after him. He warned the assembly, saying, Move away from the tents of these wicked men. Don't touch anything that is theirs, or you will be swept away because of all their sins. So they moved away from near the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. Dathan and Abram came outside and were standing at the entrance of their tents with their wives, their children, and their little ones. Moses said, By this you will know that Adonai has sent me to do all these works, that they are not from my own heart. If every one of these men die a common death and experience what happens to all people, then Adonai has not sent me. But if Adonai brings about a new thing, and the earth opens her mouth and swallows them and everything that is theirs, and they go down alive into Sheol, then you will know that these men have despised Adonai. As soon as he had finished saying all these things, the ground split under them. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them, along with all their households, all of Korah's people, and all their possessions. They went down alive into Sheol, they and everything that was theirs. The earth closed over them, and they were gone from among the community. All Israel around them fled at their outcry, for they shouted, Perhaps the earth will swallow us. Fire also came out from Adonai and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eleazar, son of Aaron, the Kohen, to take the censers from the burning, because they are holy, and scatter the coals at a distance. As for the senses of these men who sinned at the cost of their lives, let them be taken and hammered into sheets as a covering from the altar. For they were presented before Adonai, so they are holy. They are to be assigned to Benai Israel. So Eliezer the Kohen collected the bronze senses brought by the ones who were burned and hammered them into an overlay for the altar. Just as Adonai had spoken to him by Moses' hand, so that would, it would be a reminder to B'nai Israel that no one who was not a descendant of Aaron would burn incense before Adonai, and so no one would become like Korah and his following. The next day, the entire community of B'nai Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, You killed Adonai's people. But when they gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned toward the tent of meeting, behold, the cloud covered it and the glory appeared. Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of meeting. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from among this assembly, so that I may immediately consume them. So they fell on their faces. Then Moses said to Aaron, Take the censer. Put into it fire from the altar and bring it and put in incense. Get going and hurry to the assembly and make atonement for them, because wrath has come out from Adonai and the plague has started. 
Aaron did just as Moses had said and ran into the middle of the assembly. Behold, the plague had already started among the people, but he offered the incense and made atonement for the people. He stood between the dead and living, and the plague stopped. However, there were 14,700 dead from the plague, besides those who died because of Korah. Then Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting when the plague had been halted. The sprouting of Aaron's rod, number 17. <clears throat> Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the B'nai Israel and get a rod from each ancestral house, twelve staffs in all, from each prince according to his ancestral household. Write each man's name on his staff. Write Aaron's name on Levi's staff, for there is to be one staff for the prince of each tribe. Then you are to place them in the tent of meeting before the testimony where I meet with you. It will come about that the staff of the man I chose will sprout. I will then rid myself of the grumblings of B'nai Israel who are grumbling against you. So Moses spoke to B'nai Israel. Each of their princes gave him a staff, one staff for each prince, according to their ancestral houses, twelve staffs in all, and Aaron's staff was among them. Moses placed the staffs before Adonai in the tent of testimony. The next day, Moses entered the tent of testimony, and behold, Aaron's staff from the house of Levi had sprouted, blossomed, and produced almonds. Wow, do you think we're in a, in a fast-paced life today? <laughs> that was pretty quick, overnight, <laughs> to have almonds. <laughs> Moses then brought all the staffs from Adonai's presence to all B'nai Israel. They looked, and each man took his staff. Adonai said to Moses, Put Aaron's staff back in front of the tesserae to keep as a sign to the sons of rebellion so that it may put an end to their grumblings against me, and so they will not die. Moses did just as Adonai had commanded him. But B'nai Israel said to Moses, saying, Look, we will die. We are all lost. We are lost. Anyone approaching the tabernacle of Adonai will die. Must all of us die? Bermidbar 18 verses 1 to 17. Adonai said to Aaron, you, your sons, and the house of your father with you will bear the guilt for the sanctuary, and you and your sons will bear the guilt for your priesthood. Bring with you your brothers, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, so that they may join you and assist you, both you and your sons with you, before the tent of the testimony. They are to perform their duties for you and for all matters related to the tent. They must not approach the implements of the sanctuary or the altar, otherwise both you and they will die. They are to learn with you and attend to the tent of meeting for all the service of the tent, but no unauthorized person may intrude upon you so you are to attend to the sanctuary and the care of the altar, so no further wrath will fail on B'nai Israel. See, I have personally taken your kinsmen, the Levites, from among B'nai Israel as a gift for you and your sons for you, with you, dedicated to Adonai to serve in the work of the tent of meeting. But you and your sons and you are to maintain your priesthood for everything pertaining to the altar and inside the parakhet. parakhet. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> um, I am giving you the ministry of the priesthood as a gift. Anyone unauthorized who approaches you, approaches, anyone unauthorized who approaches will die. Adonai said to Aaron, See, I have given you charge over all my offerings, all the sacred things from B'nai Israel. 
I have given to you as set aside for you and your sons as a permanent share. You are to have the part of the most holy things that is kept from the fire, whether grain, sin or guilt offerings that they bring to me as most holy, they are for you and your sons. You are to eat it as, as most holy. Every male may eat it. It is set apart for you. This, is, this also is yours. The gift of the wave offerings of B'nai Israel. I have given all the wave offerings as a permanent share to you, your sons and your daughters. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. All the finest olive oil, the finest new wine and grain they give to Adonai from their first fruits. I have given them to you. All the first fruits of the land that they bring to Adonai will be yours. Anyone who is clean in your house may eat it. Every devoted thing in Israel is yours. The first offspring of the womb from all flesh, whether human or animal, offered to Adonai is yours. However, you are to redeem the firstborn of man and the firstborn of unclean animals when they are a month old. You are to redeem them at the redemption price of five shekels of silver by the sanctuary shekel or 20 geras. But the firstborn of the ox, sheep or goat you are not to redeem. They are holy. You are to sprinkle their blood on the altar and their fat you are to burn as a fire offering, a pleasing aroma to Adonai. Verse 18, sorry. Their meat, the breast of the waver offering, and the right thigh is yours. Whatever is set aside from the holy offerings which B'nai Israel presented to Adonai, I have given to you, your sons and your daughters, with you as a permanent share. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before Adonai for you and your offspring. Adonai said to Aaron, you will have no inheritance in their land, nor share among them. I am your portion, and you share, and your share among B'nai Israel. See, I have given all the tithes in Israel to the sons of Levi as an inheritance, in return for all the work of, of the service they are doing in the tent of meeting. From now on, B'nai Israel must never trans, uh, trespass the tent of meeting, or they will bear the consequences of their sin and die. The Levites will perform the service of the tent of meeting. They will bear the responsibility for their iniquity. It is a permanent ordinance throughout your generations. So among uh, ben, Bene Israel, they are to receive no inheritance. For I have given the tithes that Bene Israel presented to Adonai as an offering to the Levites as an inheritance. That is why I said they would receive no inheritance among Bene Israel. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak now to the Levites and say to them, When you receive from Bene Israel the tithe which I have given to you as your inheritance, you are then to offer to Adonai a tithe of that tithe. Your offering will be reckoned as grain from the th threshing floor or the fullness of the winepress. Thus you will also present an offering to Adonai from all your tithes that you receive from Bene Israel, and from that you are to give Adonai's portion to Aaron the Kohen. From all your gifts that you receive, you are to present the best and holiest from them as Adonai's portion. Say to them, when you present the best part, it will be reckoned to the Levites as the produce of the thr threshing floor and of the winepress. You and your household may eat, eat it in any place. It is your wage for your service in the tent of meeting. In presenting the best part in this manner, you will bear no guilt 
in these matters. You will not defile the holy things of B'nai Israel, so you will not die. We move now to 1 Samuel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let's go to Gilgal and reaffirm, reaffirm the kingdom there. So all the people went to Gilgal. And there they made Saul king before Adonai in Gilgal. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before Adonai. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Then Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have listened to your voice in all you said to me, and have set a king over you. Now here is the king who will go before you while I am old and grey. Also, here are my sons with you. I have gone before you from my youth to this day. Here I am. Witness against me before Adonai and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken, or whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I defrauded, or whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I taken a bribe to look the other way? I will restore it to you. They replied, You haven't defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from anyone's hand. Then he said to them, Adonai is then a witness against you, and his anointed is a witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. He is a witness, they replied. Then Samuel said to the people, It is Adonai who appointed Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. So now stand still, so that I may plead with you before Adonai concerning all the righteous acts of Adonai which he did for you and your fathers. When Jacob entered Egypt and your fathers cried out to Adonai, then Adonai sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt, and settled them in this place. But they forgot Adonai their God, so he gave them over into the hand of Sisera, captain of the army of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, who fought against them. So they cried out to Adonai and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken Adonai and have worshipped the Baalim and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us from the hands of our enemies and we will worship you. Then Adonai sent Jeroboam, Bedan, Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you from the hands of your enemies on every side so that you may live securely. And when you saw Nahash, king of the Ammonites, marching against you, you said to me, No, but a king must reign over us, even though Adonai your God is your king. Now, therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have asked for. And behold, Adonai has set him as king over you. If you fear Adonai and worship him and listen to his voice and do not rebel against the, ca the command of Adonai, then both you as well as the king who reigns over you will be following Adonai your God. But if you do not listen to the voice of Adonai and rebel against the command of Adonai, then the hand of Adonai will be against you and your fathers. Now stand by and see this great thing that Adonai will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call to Adonai that he may send thunder and rain. Then you will know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of Adonai by asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel prayed to Adonai, and Adonai sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared Adonai and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to Adonai your God, that we would not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. Samuel said to the people, Fear not. Indeed, you have done all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following Adonai, but worship Adonai with all your heart. Do not turn aside to go after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are futile. For Adonai will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased Adonai to make you a people to himself. Isaiah 66, 1 to 24. We tremble at his word. Thus says Adonai, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is the house you would build for me? Where is the place of my rest? For my hand has made all these things, so all these things came to be, declares Adonai. But on this one will I look, one humble and of a contrite spirit, who trembles at my word. One who kills an ox is like one who kills a man. One who sacrifices a lamb, like one who breaks a dog's neck. One who offers a grain offering is like one who offers swine's blood. One who burns incense is like one who blesses an idol. They have chosen their own ways, so their soul delights in their abominations. 
So I will choose their punishments and will bring upon them what they dread. For when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not listen. But they did what was evil in my eyes and chose what I did not delight in. Hear the word of Adonai, for you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hated you, excluding you from my name's sake, have said, Let Adonai be glorified, that we may see your joy. But they will be put to shame. A sound of uproar from the city, a sound from the temple, the sound of Adonai, who fully repays his enemies. A nation born in a day. Before she was in labour, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Can a land be born in a day? Can a nation be brought forth at once? For as soon as Zion was in labour, she gave birth to her children. Will I bring the moment of birth and not give delivery? Says Adonai. Will I, who caused delivery, shut up the womb? Says your God. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice with, for joy with her, all you who mourned over her. For you will nurse and be satisfied from her comforting breast. You will drink deeply and delight from her glorious abundance. For thus, says Adonai, behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. You will be nursed, carried on the hip and bounced on the knee as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. So you will be comforted in Jerusalem. You will see your heart will rejoice and your bones will flourish like grass. So the hand of Adonai will be known to his servants and his indignation to his enemies. For behold, Adonai will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and his sword, Adonai will execute judgment on all flesh and those slain by Adonai will be many. Those who consecrate and purify themselves to enter the groves, following after one in the midst who eats swine's flesh, vermin and mice, will come to an end altogether. It is a declaration of Adonai, for I know their works and their thoughts. It will come about that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they will come and see my glory. Then I will set up a sign among them, and I will send survivors from them to the nations, to Tarshish, Pul and Lud, who pull the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to distant islands that have not heard my fame nor seen my glory. Then they will declare my glory among the nations. Then they will bring all your kinsmen from the nations as an offering to Adonai, on horses and in chariots and on litters, mules and camels, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says Adonai. Just as B'nai Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of Adonai, I will also take some of them as priests and for Levites, says Adonai. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, will endure before me, it is a declaration of Adonai, so your descendants and your name will endure. And it will come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh will come to bow down before me, says Adonai. As they leave, they will look on the corpses of the people who rebelled against me, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched and they will be a horror to all flesh. And we saw the beginning of that prophecy in 1948. It's wonderful having the, um, the scriptures read out like that. It tends to sort of, I don't know for you, it tends to open it up. It's like somebody's just opening up the book and it takes on a whole different thing compared to when you're sitting at home going through these endless lists of things, it, doing it. It's a great job, all the readers do, um, because it puts such colour on it. It's a wonderful thing. So anyway, we will wait. Um, that's what we're going to sing now. And waiting is something that we don't do very well at all. <laughs> Even in times past, um, if we had to wait 40 years to do you know, one little thing, I'm sure we'd give up, like I would anyway. So we must, must remember that we will wait on the Lord. And when he speaks, it might not be for that moment. It might be for some time. But if he's spoken, then we'll wait.
Father. Thank you, Lord, that um, you give us things in your word that we are to do. And Lord, as Chris said, it's really hard to wait sometimes. But Lord, we just see what you will do if we do wait. We'll rise up with wings as eagles. We'll run and not be weary and walk and not faint. Teach us, Lord, to wait. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Amen. Amen. Well, now we've got the privilege of having um, Wayne coming to speak to us about Israel, his trip to, recent trip to Israel with Linda. Linda's not here, unfortunately, but um, Wayne is going to hold up the flag for them both. <laughs> so, welcome, Wayne. Yeah, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, my name's Wayne. Um, you've probably seen Linda around. Unfortunately, she was exhausted this morning after a super big week, so she's having a rest. So uh, she probably wouldn't have said a lot anyway this morning. <laughs> she, would, she, <laughs> she usually sees all the things that I, and then I can talk about them. So uh, anyway, yeah, so um, about three weeks ago, we got back from Israel, and uh, um, it was a real privilege to be able to get over there. And, uh, but before I just sort of talk about that, I, just a little bit of a, a background to it, I guess, and that is in 2009, God started to um, put a real love in our hearts for Israel, and uh, I, had, I had a revelation, it wasn't anything super or anything like that, but it was a revelation of Israel that um, has lasted these last nine years and has grown, <laughs> and it just started a little, and, and just, you know, more understanding came, more understanding came with time, and... Uh, but I know, uh, talking to him, i got a daughter. My second daughter lives in Jerusalem. Um, her and her husband serve with Bridges for Peace and uh, long-term over there now. So, um, uh, yeah, and so we'd Skype, and she'd say, oh, Dad, you still, you still haven't got it. You know, she'd, I'd say, oh, I've just learnt this, and I figured this out. And she said, no, nah, well, no, she still haven't quite got it. <laughs> you need to come over, and you need to see it, you know. Until you see it, you're really not going to understand. And... Uh, so, yeah, so it was a real blessing to be able to get over there. And um, uh, I suppose about six years ago, we started hosting Israeli tourists, and, and uh, we probably had about 60 or 70 through our house. But um, I suppose the last, in, in that time, um, during the kiwi fruit season, because we live in Tipuki, we've had some stay for us for a month or six weeks or two months, some of them. And so we've got to know them really well. And uh, so we were able to uh, meet up with four of them when we went to Israel which was a real blessing, and uh, I'll touch on that a bit in a minute. So, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so basically there was five aspects uh, to our trip, and Sharon had mentioned, you know, when she asked us if we'd say something, you know, to try and bring out something that, anything that drew us closer to God or anything like that, and I talked to Lynn, and I said, well, actually, I don't think there was anything really that drew us any closer to God than what we already were, um, just being honest. Um, but God did do some things in our lives, and I think we did come back different, and we did have some revelation over there. So the, f the first thing we wanted to do, obviously, was catch up with our, our first grandchild in um, Jerusalem, and who we hadn't seen, only on Skype. So um, it was a real amazing time to spend that four weeks or that month with Stephen and Letitia, and... Uh, we wanted to see Israel itself and, and, you know, the land and the people. And um, Linda wanted to go to Jordan. She wanted to go to Petra. And I really wasn't. I'm not that interested in rocks. Linda's more interested in archaeology and that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, it's people that fire me up and what's going on now. You know, God, what are you doing now? Where are you, God, in the midst, all, in the midst of all this? And uh, so that's what I was interested in. So, but I said, okay, we can go to Jordan. We can't go that far um, and have you miss out on that if that's what you want to do. And uh, catching up with the Israeli tourists, that was really great too. And um, um, uh, Shimshong knows one of them and uh, spent quite a bit of time with him as well in New Zealand. And uh, yeah, just seeing what, uh, just a fresh encounter with God and, and getting direction and what God wanted, was wanting us to do and, and just what God was doing. So. Um, yeah, no, it's really, it's quite interesting because, like, I found that when we were there, it's like, you know, if you've ever been in a move of God somewhere 
and uh, God's been moving really powerful, you know, for a period of time, and your life has been absolutely transformed in that time, and then it slowly dies off, and then five or ten years later, you go back to that place, and he's not there. <laughs> he's not there like he was when he was moving like he was. And so all these stories in the Bible that we all know, and you go back to all these places, for me, I'm going, well, you're not here, God, in that way, you know. He's moved on. He's doing something else. It's history and there's rocks. There's heaps of rocks in Israel. And uh, not many of them actually have anything to do with Jewish history. It's mainly the Romans and the Greeks. And if you like that sort of stuff, it's all interesting and it all feel, helps. It's all, I'm not putting it down, but it just, it doesn't, it's not what uh, ticks my boxes. Um, so we saw all sorts of things and um, we walked for miles. Uh, we caught up with um had a little bit of time with Stefan and Letitia's leaders and the Messianic congregation they went to, and that was really quite good. Um, and uh, But I don't want to waste my time sort of talking about that sort of stuff. Um, probably what, what you guys would be interested in was, like when we went to Jordan, we went for three days, and uh, I've never been in a Muslim nation before. And... Um, yeah, we saw lots of desert. <laughs> you know, we went to Petra and uh, Wadi Rum and that sort of stuff. But by the second day, I was starting to get a headache and crook gut. And I was going, oh, you know, this is, this is, this is quite heavy here. This is quite hard going. And, um, and then by the third day, I really had a headache. And three Panadol did nothing. When we got to Wadi Rum, all the others were running around and running up these um, sand dunes and stuff. I just got out of the ute and I just laid on my back on the sand. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I felt dreadful. But when we... And then we had to drive five hours back up to the um, Allenby Bridge border crossing. And uh, we went through the Jordanian border control and then halfway across to the Israeli border control... I don't know if it was right on the Jordan River, but it would have been right on the boundary. All of a sudden, just went, Psh! my headache was gone. Linda turned around and we said, whoo, the atmosphere here has changed, hasn't it? And, um, and that's when it was like, I don't know. It was like, for me, it was like a little veil got torn and I saw, and, all I could, and I, what I saw was electricity. Bzzz, you know, sparks and arcs and just electricity in Israel. And I realized, whoa, you know, God is here. God is in Israel. You, you, know, you know, we walk around in this body and, and until God actually gives us a little revelation and gives us a glimpse of something, we don't actually see it. We can't see it. We don't know it. But, um, and it was like going from death to life. Um, when we flew into Israel, um, because we come from such a green country, going into Israel, you know, I've heard, oh, it's flourishing and it's all the, all the production and the land is coming to life again and all the rest. And I looked around and I thought, well, there was no impact for me coming from New Zealand. But when we came back in from Jordan, whoa, it was just like amazing going, because it's right next door, like Joel said, next door. They've, they've only got a little bit of fruit, uh, food growing area in the Jordan Valley beside the Jordan River. But basically, it's, it's, the land is just struggling. It's just dead. And uh, nothing's, nothing's happening there. So that was probably one of the main things that I saw. And, uh, um, yeah, so that, you know, that's... I felt such a, um, well, like, to be born in a nation <laughs> that's under that principality would be just horrendous. You know, we need to be praying for the Middle East. We need to be praying for these people that are caught up under that principality, and they are really oppressed and really bound. And uh, so anyway, uh, one highlight for us, another one was Yal, the first Israeli tourist that stayed with us for two months. Um, he was quite amazing. Um, he came along to a couple of Arev Shabbats. And 
um, I remember uh, reading from Romans 1 to Romans 12 or 13, I think it was, with him. Because his English wasn't that good. So at night after dinner, we'd read a chapter. And the stuff that he understood <laughs> was staggering for me, uh, being a completely secular Jew with a communist background. And um, uh, so when we, he came and saw us very, uh, very early on in the trip, and he actually came to a messianic, the Letitia and Stefan's messianic congregation. He was sitting there, he was shaking. He was so fearful. Um, and all the creases in his forehead and, and all that sort of stuff. But he settled down. It was the first time he'd ever been to a Messianic congregation in Israel or anywhere. You know, it was, so that was really good. And um, so I, I guess Linda would have filled in a lot more details about babies and about all this and the other thing. <laughs> but really what, what I've come back with is especially that first week after we were back, it was Ezekiel 36. And we're going to pray for Israel in a minute, so I'm going to read it. And this is what I just could not get away from this. For the whole week, I just kept reading it, and there'd be tears in my eyes. And, you know, like it was just alive. And it says here in, in verse uh, 24, For I shall take you from among the nations. This is talking about the, um, the, is the Hebrew people, um, the whole lot of them, you know, the Jews and all the others. I'll take you from among the nations and gather you out of the, all the countries and will bring you into your own land. That's step one. Step two, then I shall sprinkle clean water upon you and you will be clean from all your filthiness and all your idols. And, you know, 80% of the Jews, is, is, uh, uh, people living in Israel are secular. And there's many of them that aren't even Jewish. They've just got in through their immigration system. And, uh, and, then, and God talks about, I shall cleanse you, and I will give you a new mind and put a new spirit within you, and I will take away the stony mind from your flesh and will give you a mind of flesh. And I shall put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep and do my judgments. And you will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you will be my people, and I am, I am, will be your God. I will also deliver you from all your uncleanness and I shall call for the grain and increase it and lay no famine upon you and I shall multiply the fruit of the tree and increase of the field so that you will take no more reproach of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations." Not for your sake am I doing this, says Jehovah. Be it known to you to be ashamed and confused for your own ways, O house of Israel. So praise God. God's doing something absolutely um, sovereign, really. And uh, pity help any man that plays around and interferes with what he's doing over there, I would suspect. <laughs> And I think people need to be really careful, and organizations and churches need to be really careful about what they're trying to do in Israel. Seems like in Jerusalem, you've got every major denomination, every major religious organization, religious organization in the world, and it's like they all want control of Jerusalem. And it's, uh, it's um, serious stuff. God's going to move. <laughs> he's moving now and nothing can stop him he's bringing his people back and uh, so uh, yeah that's that's something I came back with too we need to be careful how we walk we need to be lined up with scripture so anyway I better I'll start preaching so let's stand up shall we let's let's pray for Israel now thank you father lord we do we just praise you father we thank you for what you're doing in that land in your land Father, you say it's your land. And Lord, you've said that it's for your people to live in. And Father, we thank you that you're drawing your people home, Lord God. Lord, from all the tribes, all the Hebrew nation, all the Hebrew tribes, Lord, you're drawing them back right now. And Father, we thank you for that. Lord, you're establishing them in the land. Lord, you're enabling them to support themselves in the land. You're enabling the, and you're causing the land to flourish, Lord God, the land to come alive, Lord God, for produce to, to increase out of the land. 
And uh, so, Father, and we thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, that you are revealing yourself to your people there. Lord, just a little trickle at the moment, Lord, less than 1% messianic. But, Lord God, Lord, we know, Lord God, that when there's a little trickle, Lord, in a dam, Lord, after a while, that trickle will become, Lord, a little, little squirt, and then it'll become a bigger stream, Lord God. And then finally, Lord, that dam will break through, and there will be a major, major move of your spirit in that nation. And, Lord, the eyes of your people will be opened. And we thank you for that, Lord God. Lord, we pray, pour out your spirit, Lord, upon Israel. Lord, pour out your spirit on the Messianic believers. Pour out your spirit, Lord God, on the Messianic leaders, Lord God. Father, lead them and guide them into, into what you would have them to be doing and into your ways. We thank you, Lord God, that even though we don't see much spiritual stuff happening in Israel, Lord, we know, Lord God, that you're moving by your spirit working the soil, preparing their hearts. Lord, that you're getting things ready. Lord, you're arranging nations. You're moving nations around. You're um, arranging situations and circumstances to completely reshape the, the political Middle East, Father. And uh, so, Father, we give you glory for all that you're doing in that place. And, Father, we ask, well, Lord, we just want to, Lord, just remind you of your promises, Lord, to Israel. Lord, we remind you, we, we, we continue to remind you, Lord God, your promises to restore, to redeem, Lord, and to make Israel the nation that you've called them to be, Lord, and that they will love their Messiah, that they will just be so radically on fire for their Messiah, Lord God, and that, Lord, when you do reveal yourself to them, that the nations of the earth will be shaken to their core. And, uh, Father, we can't wait to see the look on the media's faces <laughs> and all the cried, all the tears <laughs> lord we thank you lord that the nations will be shocked lord when you reveal yourself as the king of the universe through your people israel amen Just coming down on the world, this little mic. <laughs> well, thanks, Wayne. That was really terrific. And thank you for praying for Israel. That's great. Um, now, if we just continue to pray just for a minute, I've, there's a few from our midst that are really sick. So we've had Dorothy, who's now home from hospital, so that's really good, but she's still very, very ill. Um, Rainer, who's in hospital, and he's not good at all, so we really need to lift him up. Um, Andrea, we continue to pray for her for strength. And Linda, who still hasn't managed to, um, to come back yet. So, um, yeah, Linda has had a, a chest infection, and she's been quite ill. So if we can just remember to pray for each one of those. So just bow your head. Lord, we thank you that you are our healer, Lord Jesus. And we just pray for these ones, Lord. We pray for Dorothy, that you would strengthen her, Lord. Strengthen her body and restore her. We just pray that she will um, sense your presence with her today and that you will encourage her heart. And Lord, we pray for Raina, who's in the hospital and... and uh, facing some things in his, in his health, Lord. We just pray you would touch him too, that, Lord, you would be his strength and his song and that he'd keep his eyes fixed firmly on you. We pray you'd surround him and give him peace in his heart, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And, Lord, we lift up Andrea to you. Father God, we just pray that you would give her strength too, Lord to go through the things she's going through. We thank you that she's at home and we just pray that you will bring her healing each day, Lord, and she'll get stronger and stronger. Father God, thank you. And Lord, for Linda, we just pray she'll be back in our midst really soon. We miss her. <laughs> and Lord, we just pray that she will recover and that um, you will touch her lungs, Lord, and restore them. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Mm. Amen. 
Now, if you want a little friendship break, um, we can probably have about five minutes. But that's that's limit today. <laughs> so, um, just if anyone would like prayer, then um, any one of us, or, or just ask the person next to you, we'd be quite happy to pray for you. And um, any needs that you have that we haven't covered, um, yeah, come and ask someone to pray. Okay, five minutes. Okay, now we are going to go to Luke. Now Yeshua entered Jericho and was passing through. And here was a man by the name of Zacharias, who was the chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacharias was trying to see who Yeshua was, but he couldn't because of the crowd, for he was short in height. Some of us understand what it feels like. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Yeshua, for he was about to pass through that way. When Yeshua came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus hurried and came down and welcomed him joyfully. But when everyone saw it, they began to grumble, saying, Yeshua has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus... Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, Master, half of my possessions I give to the poor, and if I have somehow cheated anyone, I repay four times as much. Then Yeshua said to him, Today salvation has come to this home, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. As they were listening to this, Yeshua went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was about to appear at once. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went to a faraway land to receive for himself a kingdom, and then return. And calling ten of his own slaves, he gave them ten minas, and said to them, Do business until I come back. But his citizens detested him, and they sent a delegation after him, saying, We don't want this fellow to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he called for those slaves to whom he had given the money. He wanted to know how much business they had done. Now the first appeared, saying, Master, your one mina has made ten. The master said to him, Well done, good slave. Because you were faithful with so little, take charge over ten cities. Also the second slave came, saying, Your mina, master, made five. Then he also said to this one, you are likewise over five cities. But another came saying, Master, here is your minna. I was keeping it safe in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you because you are a strict man. You take what you did not make and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, By the words of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked slave. You knew that I am strict, taking what I did not make and reaping what I did not sow. Then why didn't you put my money in the bank so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest? Then to the bystanders he said, Take the minna from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. But they said to him, Sir, he has ten minas. I tell you, to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who doesn't have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But those hostile to me who didn't want me to reign over them, bring them here and execute them before me. A workman with the word. Remind them of these things and sol solemnly charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which is useless, to the ruin of those who are listening. Make every effort to present themselves before God as tried and true as an unashamed worker cutting a straight path with the word of truth. But avoid godless chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their words will spread like cancer. Among them are Hymeranus and Philitus. Men who have missed the mark concerning the truth, saying that they are a resurrection has already taken place. They are overturn, overturning their faith of some. Needless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. 
the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord keep away from unrighteousness. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honour and some for common use. Therefore it is with clean therefore if anyone cleanses himself from these, he will be a vessel of honour, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from your youthful desires, instead pursue righteousness, faithfulness, love and shalom. For those who call it on on the Lord from a pure heart, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that produce quarrels. The Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach and tolerant. Let him give evidence with humility to those who are in opposition. Perhaps God may grant them a change of mind leading to the knowledge of truth. Then they will rein their senses and escape the devil's snares in which they have been held captive by him to do his will. For certain people have secretly slipped in, those who from long ago have been marked out for this judgment. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into indecency and deny our only Master and Lord, Yeshua, the Messiah. Now I wish to remind you, though you have come to know all things, that the Lord, once having saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels, who did not keep their own position of authority but deserted their proper place, he has kept in everlasting shackles under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. In the same way as those, these angels, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after a different sort of flesh, are displayed as an example suffering the punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same way, these people also, by their visionary dreaming, defile the flesh, reject the Lord's authority, and defame glorious beings. But when Michael the archangel, disputing with the devil, was arguing about the body of Moses, he did not dare to render a judgment against him for slander, but said, May the Lord rebuke you. But these people slander whatever they do not understand, and whatever they do not understand instinctively, like animals without reason, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they went the way of Cain. They were consumed for pay in Balaam's error, and in Korah's rebellion they have been destroyed. These people are hid in rocky reefs at your love feasts, shamelessly feasting with you, tending only to themselves. They are waterless clouds, carried along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these people that Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied saying, behold, the Lord came with myriads of his Kedishim to execute judgment against all. He will convict all the ungodly for all their ungodly deeds that they have done in an ungodly way, and for all of the harsh things ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are bellyaching grumblers, following after their own desires. Their mouth speaks grandiose things, having favoritism for the sake of gain. But you, loved ones, ought to remember the words previously proclaimed by the emissaries, emissaries of our God, Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, how they kept telling you, in the last time there will be scoffers following after their own ungodly desires. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, not having the Ruach. But you, loved ones, continue building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Ruach HaKodesh. Keep yourselves in the love of God, eagerly waiting for the mercy of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who are wavering. Save them by snatching them out of the fire. But on others, have mercy with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. 
now to the one who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Saviour, through Yeshua the Messiah our Lord, be glory, majesty, power and authority before all time, both now and forever. Amen. Joel, Sharon, hope you have a good time. Hope you enjoy Topa, and you get rest. Come back and see us next week. <clears throat> Once again, I've made notes, and I feel like God is taking me off script. Thank you, Helper. Today's Torah portion was called Korach. Korach is named after Korah. Okay? <clears throat> His name means bald, baldness, and also ice. Kerach. It's the same root word. Be careful, Kahan. His name suited him because he was lacking. Baldness is a lack of, okay? He was lacking the spiritual insight. He was lacking the integrity to honor the prophet that God put in place. He led a rebellion against God's prophet and against God's priest. And he led many into destruction. That same spirit is operating today. See, he was a Levite. Now, all Levites are Levites, but not all priests. All, wait. All Levites are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. Though all priests come from the tribe of Levi. Okay? It's a, through Aaron's seed, though they were all the sons of Levi. But today, whether they're actual Levites, the servants of God are leading men and women into destruction. They're leading them into their own paths. See, what stood out for me was Korah attacked Moses and Aaron <clears throat> and said, you have gone too far. For all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. That's the same today as Rob Bell, and not to pick on Rob Bell, but there's many like him who are just saying, you can live the way you want to live, and you will be saved. All will enter in. That's the spirit of Korah. That's the root of rebellion. These are men and women who are supposed to know the word. Wayne, what you said was profound. We need to know the word. We need to know the word. Without it, we're doomed. So they didn't have the written word back then. Korah didn't have the written word. Moses hadn't written the tablets yet. Hadn't written the scrolls yet. Kahu, please come out from there, sweet. Sorry. But there's no excuse for us today. Men and women are going away from God due to their own lustful desires. Billy Graham preached in England in 1950s, and he said, when we close our eyes and ears to God's way, we will soon prefer our own ideas to the eyes of God, ideas of God. You will come to a stage where your own evil seems good to you, and God's good seems to be evil. And we are certainly there today. Certainly there. Maybe it's never changed. But all we know is what we look around and see today. But that's what Korah did. It's exactly what he did. He called what God wanted evil. You took us out of a land flowing with milk and honey, calling Egypt the land flowing with milk and honey. How quickly he forgot slavery. This path leads to death and destruction. I had a whole bunch of notes, but nope. Nope.
This is a day God wants to encourage people. And I'm saying this very heavy. So maybe when I feel like there's one here, maybe I'm here to preach to myself. Maybe there's ten. Maybe every one of us needs encouragement today from God. So I love that song that you sang. But sadly, I, the last song, I don't find it to be true. I don't know about you, but I get weary. I get tired. I know the truth. I preach the truth. With my last dying breath, I will preach Yeshua. But being honest, man, I get weary. I get tired of the nonsense. We don't need Satan. We've got the body of believers to tear each other apart. But it's prophetic. And that's what we have to hang on to, the truth of God's word. I'm going to jump to Jude. So there was a common theme in today's portion. There was so much meat to eat and look at, as every week. But this one really seemed to be many different veins to go down. But for me, the theme was to turn away from evil. To stay the course according to God's word, no matter how difficult the journey may be. Because at the end, there will be rejoicing. There will be eternal peace. There will be eternal joy. To me, that was the theme. Jude said, the last scripture, But you, loved ones, ought to remember the words previously proclaimed by the emissaries of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, how they kept telling you in the last time there will be scoffers following after their ungodly desires. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, not having the ruach, but you, loved ones, Continue building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Ruach HaKodesh. Keep yourselves in the love of God, eagerly awaiting for the mercy of our Lord Yeshua that leads to eternal life. So we don't want to be like Korach. We don't want to be Kerach. We don't want to be ice. If our love grows cold, See, we're already living under the, under the spiritual umbrella, which scripture says, due to the wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. So that bubble, that spiritual bubble affects us. Remember it said Yeshua preached in the Galilee, but he couldn't do many miracles because of their unbelief. Here's Yeshua. He couldn't do miracles because he was under that spiritual bubble. How much greater are we under that bubble? And because of the wickedness that is reigning today, there was always wickedness, obviously. We read from first family till today, but the days, the wickedness is no longer shame. It's proud, pride, stealing God's rainbow. Look how evil I live my life and let me be prideful of it. Do you remember when you were in the world, these things we brag on? I've got the worst temper, man. No, no, I got the worst temper. No, I got the worst temper. No, my back's really bad. No, I got the worst back. No, my knee. We brag about all these bad things. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. There's a famous uh, soccer star now, the first one in Brazil, who's actually filing to marry, legally marry two women in the same wedding. If it passes, that'll be another flood, floodgate open. So we have to fight according to Jude, but loved ones, continue building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, because otherwise our love will grow cold. We will become like Korah. And what happens is we get hurt, and we get hurt, and we hurt one another. And then what happens? We become a Rob Bell. Now, what happened to him? I'm not casting a stone at him, but he's one out there with TV shows, books, who went from one gospel to this. Everybody saved, so since he's out there publicly, I'm not trying to trash him. But something must have happened to him. 
There might have been so many stones cast against him that his love, true love for Messiah, went cold to turn him away. And this is what each and every one of us has to fight through. My trip, our trip to Israel, was a great family trip. But for me, there were different dimensions. I'm just going to be open and honest. I had many stones cast against me there. To go back to Israel to find out that people in New Zealand are calling people in Israel to find out if I'm even a believer. I've been called an Old Testament preacher, but that is he even a believer? That hurt me to the core. Okay? Then others, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, I'm doing ministry. Really? You? Who'd come listen to you? You know? So it's just nonstop. But this is the importance. You have to know who you are in God. If you ever see I walk around, I wear hats and I wear shirts, and it says Jeremiah 15, 16. Because that's been my scripture. And it says, Thy word was found, and I did eat of it. And it became the joy and delight of my heart, for I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. And that's got me through day one till today. It doesn't matter. It does matter. It bothers the heck out of me. It hurts me. Because if we'd all be lying when we say it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. Sticks and stones may break my bones. But names will kill you. So I come back to New Zealand and I see somebody. Now oh, I'll skip that story. Anyway, it's just been bam, 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 bam. After 29 years, my love could go cold, but I'm hanging on to the word. I'm fighting through because that's all there is to do. So I'm sharing this to encourage you because everybody in this room is going through something, went through something, or is about to go through something. Okay? And if you just went through it, a week from now, you know, there'll be another mountain to climb. So you've got to know who you are in Messiah. And you need to know who he is and the truth of his word. Because that is the only weapons that we have to stand strong in it. Because at the end of the day, we're about pleasing him. I have to trust God to deal with those people that speak nonsense about me. It's easy to curse them. But I refuse to do it because the word tells me, have patience. Be gentle to those who come against you. In my past life, there wasn't much gentle about me. But that's 29 years ago. That person's long dead. So I share my stuff to encourage you. Know who you are in God. Know his promises to you. I shared this with Jamie a while ago. Find a scripture. Find something that speaks to you in the word and grab a hold of it. Because you're his. You're his child. Fight for the love that he's given. Now we need to know that there is an enemy. This is scripture I'm going to read now it has nothing to do with the Torah portion, but I believe it goes along with what I'm speaking about. It's 1 Peter 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, 6 through 11. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so that he may lift you up at the appropriate time. May today be that day that he lifts you up. Cast all your worries on him, for he cares for you. Stay alert. Watch out. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, searching for someone to devour. Here's what you got to understand about lions. Sorry, I'm going to preach about lions to South Africans. <laughs> lions operate 
We'll call it the pride system. Typically two to three males with however many females that they take in. And those females are then called the bride. So you have the two males are the pride and the females make up the bride. See the spiritual pictures? We have the father and the son. We are his bride. Now, when we think of lions, we think of lions roaring. But typically, the two males in the bride rarely ever roar. They only roar three different situations. One, when they go out on a hunt. And the females bring the kill back into the, well, I want to call it a camp, but uh, where they're camping out. And as they come in, they raise up a roar in encouragement. I don't want to say thanking, you know, but roaring that now food has come back. So they're roaring them back in, welcoming them back in, bringing food for all the family. The other time is when there's an enemy. See, the roar of a lion could be heard up to 10 kilometers away. And when they know that there's an enemy in the area, they roar, telling that enemy, this is my bride. This is my territory. I am the king. You best go. See, but scripture tells us about your adversary, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion. See, there's one other kind of lion who doesn't operate in the bride system, in the pride system. He's lonely. He operates by himself. And what he does is he roars continually, that, that lion. And what he does is he comes close to the bride to deceive them, to lead them away from the protection of the males, to devour and kill them. So he's always roaring. So this is our enemy. So we are the bride. Yeshua and his father or the head of our pride, our bride. They're our protectors. But if we listen to that deceiving roar, we come away from him, their protection. And this is why we need to know the word. If we don't need the word, we don't, sorry, we don't know the word. We follow what seems nice. We follow what the voice that seems familiar that speaks to the soul, that speaks to the flesh, that speaks to the lustful desires that we all battle and get deceived. So that's why we have to fight to keep our love. Keep the flames burning, passion for our God, no matter what we're going through. Well, really believe the Lord wants to encourage all of us. Put our eyes upon him. Trust in him. Get deeper into the word. Let him correct us as we're reading. We can all read a word and come up with all different takes on what that scripture can mean. The thing in our life is some of us are always going to be wrong. Very few of us are always right. I know Heather's smiling back there without me looking, thinking I think I'm always right. But who else is guilty of that? We all think our theology is right. Some of us were going to be corrected. Some of us, the mistakes in understanding the truth of what the word says isn't so critical, salvation-wise. Some of it is. But we've got to draw close to him. We've got to fight under this bubble of wickedness that we're living in so that our love doesn't grow cold. Because what happens when the love grows cold is the clear warning. Do not look to the right. Do not look to the left. We read numbers a few weeks ago, and what really pointed out, and uh, forget which 
chapter it was. But three times, I think, in about ten verses, he made it clear. Do not go until the fire, to the cloud goes, to the pillar goes. Do not leave camp until the pillar goes. It was like three quick times, and it was like, I'm trying to get your attention. Don't go before me. And all it takes is to go a little bit this way. But he went that way. Look this way. But he went that way. We've got to fight to keep those blinders on. And what happens is when we get hurt, when we get disappointed, blinders come off. We start looking in all kinds of directions for peace, for comfort in our own flesh, in our own thoughts, in our own mind. And it's okay for me to get angry, and it's okay for me to exhibit rage, and it's okay for me to do this, and it's okay, you know what, I want to go out and get a beer, I want to go out and get a drink, or whatever it may be. I want to comfort my flesh somehow so that my spirit will feel better. But by comforting our flesh, our spirit will never rise up. We'll be comforting our soul, covering, comforting our emotions, And then we're completely out of spiritual alignment because it's supposed to be flesh, soul, spirit, Holy Spirit. And we need to get spiritually aligned. So Lord, I just pray, Father, that I've delivered your word today. Lord, that whoever it is here that needs encouragement, that they would go home, that they would look within themselves, Father, that they would seek your face diligently, Admitting where they've gone short, where they've messed up, where they have not fully trusted in you to whether, whether to provide or to defend or to fight for them, Lord. I pray that each one would go home encouraged, that they would leave different than the way they came in today. And maybe some came in hungry and longing for something. Maybe something that they didn't even know. But you have visited them today. That you've spoken truth into their heart. And they go home encouraged that their passion level for you would rise up. Cause them to seek your face. To know your word. To know your ways. And that their love would never ever grow cold, Lord. Your word to us was that the world will know that we are your disciples by the love that we have for one another. Let us stop casting stones at one another, Father. Let the world see that we are truly your disciples and that we love one another. That through that, true revival will begin, Father. For Israel will never be promoted to jealousy until the presentation of a holy God is brought before them. And without us loving and honoring one another, they will never see that, Lord. So I speak, may it begin within each one of us today, Lord. Correct us, mold us, shape us the way that you want us to be, Lord. But let each one go home today encouraged that your love for them is great, that your plan to prosper them is great, that your desire, that you reminded us through your word to draw close, to hang on to the love and the faith that we have through your son Yeshua, Lord, in your most holy name. Amen. Thank you, Shemshom. A very welcome word. It's easy to hide from the truth sometimes, and you know, and just sit under under our own little clouds. So we had planned to do the lion and the lamb. So we'll do, and then thinking on what the lions do. <laughs>
Has anybody had a birthday this week? Because there's a, there's a few lovely wee chocolates in this box. Anybody? At the back, Malcolm. Mel? Yeah? Chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> you sure it's your birthday? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Ibarechecha Adonai Vishmecha Yae Adonai Panav Elecha Vechonecha Yasa Adonai Panav Elecha Vyasem Lecha Vyasem Lecha Shalom, v'yasem lecha shalom, v'yasem lecha shalom, 
ויושם לך שלום. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Shavua Tov. Have a good week.